Hey guys, welcome back. Whenever anybody mentions the Prophets, I think that most of us, even those of us who are pretty well versed in Halo's lore, instantly think of this. A conniving, evil, weak species who manipulated countless honourable and intelligent races into doing their bidding, into following their religion, slaying all who they declared non-believers in the pursuit of supposed salvation, something that the highest ranking of their kind knew was a lie and would lead to complete galactic genocide, and yet nonetheless used this great journey as a catalyst in their pursuit of power. If you were to just play the games, then this is all you'd think the Prophets were. However, thanks to a couple sentences of lore that Bungie wrote, like way back in 2005, I think it was, for the Halo 2 map Gemini, and later, thanks to 2015's Halo Shadow of Intent, written by ex-Halo Bungie writer, the legend himself, Joe Staten, the Prophets, at least in this era of the Halo universe, are much, much more than power-tripping cripples. Within the Covenant military, there existed a rate of bio-augmented and genetically modified prophets who fought in highly advanced power armor with immense lethality. They were basically the closest comparison to the Spartans within the Covenant, and in fact were created with the sole intention of outmatching them in combat. These prophets were known as the Prelates. Today, we're going to go into a deep dive into the history of the Prelates, their augmentations, their combat proficiency, and their traditions, and also an overview of the only named Prelate in Halo lore, of whom had a bitter vendetta with Artas Vadum, believing that he and the Arbiter had entered a pact with the Gravemind to take down the Covenant, and one who was plagued by constant nightmares of the Flood devouring his family. Fellas, this is going to be one hell of a video, and honestly, I don't know why I waited so long to make it. So if at any point you find yourself enjoying it, then don't forget to leave a like and also subscribe if you haven't done so yet. And also, don't forget to go and follow the Twitch. But without any further ado, let's dive into the lore behind the secret bio-augmented warrior prophets of the Covenant. So, let's start off by looking at just who the Prelates were. Now, as you can probably imagine by the fact that we never saw any on High Charity or during our entire war with the Covenant in the games, the Prelates were a pretty rare sight within their military. Those chosen to become Prelates were done so personally by the Minister of Preparation, with the intention of becoming the Covenant's answer to the Spartans. Now, it was never disclosed if the minister, much like Halsey with the kidnapped children, sought out specific traits in those they chose, but given how innately skilled the prelates were, we can assume that they did at least to some degree. When a prophet is chosen to become a prelate, they are granted access to the Sacred Promissory, a munitions factory within High Charity responsible for the creation of many of the Covenant's arms, where they can begin their training. Covenant scientists within the Promissory use foreigner technology to alter the minds and bodies of these select few via augmentations. The Prophets are modified genetically, physically, hormonally, and chemically before being suited up in extremely advanced power armor and given intensive combat training. To aid them in combat, their armor systems came with a variety of features. An anti-gravity belt acts as pseudo-thrusters, allowing them to move sharply in any direction and even hover or fly for a limited time. Their hard-like gauntlets on their forearms can either create a deadly crescent blade for melee combat, or a hard-like shield, able to deflect projectiles that come into contact with it. Their helmets appear to be entirely vacuum-sealed, which allows for EVA combat and travel, and at the same time comes with an integrated heads-up display, complete with a motion sensor. But that's not all. Their augmentations work a little bit differently to what we're used to. Now, not only do they enhance all of the base traits of the Prophet, making them stronger pretty much across the board, but they also give the Prelate the ability to manually release chemicals into their bodies to enhance them in a variety of ways, dependent entirely upon the situation. The most common use of this ability was during combat. Chemicals would be released to temporarily boost their fighting abilities. But another, rarer use of this ability was to help control their consciousness. We'll cover this in more detail later on in the video, but a certain prelate once used this ability to ensure that he could stay asleep so he could try and alter the course of a repetitive nightmare he was having, in which his wife and child 
were consumed by the flood. Now, context matters. That sounds like some weird Inception type stuff, but trust me, it all makes sense. I'll explain it later on. However, as powerful as these short bursts of power and control were, they had to be short bursts. Putting their bodies into extreme hormonal and chemical overdrive for too long had been known to cause sudden debilitating exhaustion, seizures, and even death in the past. As powerful as they were, the prelates had to exercise restraint and use them only when they needed to. So, the procedures the prophets underwent to become prelates sound a little bit familiar, don't they? You know, they always said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. However, where the prelates and the Spartans differ massively is in their zealous devotion to the Great Journey. Now, obviously, I, I don't think the Spartans were particularly devoted to the Great Journey. I'm not sure why, but the prelates absolutely were. They would often retreat to the Garden of Reverent Contemplation, a holy, peaceful garden of worship within High Charity's upper levels, where they could be found deep in thought and meditation, praying to their gods and honouring their leader, the Holy Prophet of Truth. However, as devout as they were, they were actually given optional exemption from the role of celibates following their augmentation. Now, in case the word celibate wasn't obvious enough, the role of celibates was basically a strict covenant law that prevented certain prophets from breeding, to ensure that genetic diversity was maintained within the population, and also to prevent any negative recessive genes from being passed down the generations. So it was basically a law that forced a prophet eugenics program. Strange, strange species. Now, although the prelates could exempt themselves from this law and hit the bustling strip clubs in the lower districts of high charity on a nightly basis, oh my god, they chose not to, at least most of the time. Many feared that their augmentations would make any offspring they'd bear unhealthy, and so many of them just continued to uphold their vows of celibacy and focus only on the betterment of themselves for the glory of the covenant. But where did these elite prophets serve in the Covenant military? Why did Chief and the UNSC never encounter a single prelate during the entirety of the war? Well, sadly, we can't answer that question in full because we don't, we don't know enough about the prelates as of now to be able to do so, to put it quite frankly. There's only one prelate that's actually been named and most of our information about the prelates comes from him and his experiences, so it may differ from other prelates. We also don't know how many prelates there were during the war, and of course, that plays a factor as well. Nevertheless, based on what little information I've managed to dig out of the Oni archives, it seems the prelates were assigned to brute-controlled ships as technical advisors. Or at least, that was the official story. Like all good lies, this was only part true. Let me give you a bit of backstory. So in 2525, at the outset of the Human Covenant War, the elites were in control of almost every Covenant capital ship. However, when it appeared that the Holy Covenant were in for one hell of a conflict, they gifted some of their ships to the Brute Chieftains, who showed loyalty to the Prophets, and loyalty warranted a reward. Now, the Brutes weren't typically trusted with technology as complicated and intricate as ships, thanks to their... brutish nature. As such, when the elites handed their ships over, they hobbled them, disabled many of their major weapon systems and other protocols to ensure the Brutes didn't become too powerful and use their new tools of destruction in ways that they shouldn't. No self-respecting elite wanted to give up their frontline duties and go and train Brutes in naval combat, and so they just removed any possibility of a catastrophe. But, of course, these ships had to be effective to some degree, and so the prelates were assigned to them as technical advisors. However, seeing as this order came directly from the Prophet of Truth himself, there was an ulterior motive. This was at the very earliest dawn of the Great Schism, when whispers of a schism were only just starting to appear. The earliest plans for the Truth-endorsed brute usurping of the Elite's power were being set in motion. And so, he ordered the prelates to secretly retrofit these gifted ships and train those who commanded them in naval combat so that when the time eventually came, they'd be able to engage the elites in ship combat and come out on top. When the now Arbiter failed to protect Alpha Halo from destruction, it became clear to Truth that this would ultimately spark the schism, 
And so following the Halo's destruction, the Prelates redoubled their clandestine preparations. And if it were not for the Flood's surprise invasion of High Charity, the Elite's resounding victory in the city's orbit would have almost certainly gone a different way. And of course, by extension, that means that the Human Covenant War would have almost certainly played out very differently towards the end as well. So I guess we kind of have the Flood to thank for that. Thanks, Gravemind? When the Great Schism properly kicked off though, in the orbit of Delta Halo, Prelate Commander ships quickly engaged the Elite Fleet surrounding High Charity, taking them honestly off guard, and they managed to even destroy a CAS carrier, the Eternal Reward, following which they began targeting Artas Vadum's carrier, the Shadow of Intent. However, thankfully before they could take it down, the Flood arrived which ultimately helped give the Elite the upper hand. They formed a blockade around the Holy City, preventing any Flood-controlled ships from leaving, and in the process, took out many Prelate-controlled ships. So many, in fact, it was believed that most, if not all, of the Prelates were killed. Well, all but one. And this is where our one named Prelate comes in. Temba Tech, who believed he was the last of his kind. Again, sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Tem is believed to be the only prelate to have survived the fall of High Charity. He met with the Minister of Preparation on one of the city's docking spires as he was trying and failing to make contact with his family, and had to escort the Minister to safety, leaving behind his wife and children, of whom the Minister told him sadly had been consumed by the flood. He also informed Batek that the flood's arrival at the city during the Civil War was no coincidence. The elites and the grave mind were in fact working together. He elaborated on this shocking fact, stating that the now heretical arbiter and the Spec Ops commando, Artas Vadum, had formed a pact with the grave mind to join forces and destroy the Covenant. How oddly prophetic. Believing now that his wife and child's horrific death at the hand of the flood had been Thel and Artas's doing, Tem's heart was filled with vengeance. He and his wife, Yalar Otan Elat, fell in love in the lower districts of their former city, and Tem had even removed himself from celibacy so the two could have a child. He loved her and his child almost as much as the great journey itself, and he would have his revenge on those responsible for their horrific demise. As the two fled the city that was now becoming the largest concentration of flood in the galaxy, they managed to break through the blockade and rendezvous with a flotilla of Prophet ships that had managed to escape. When they rendezvoused with the other ships, some on board their ship, which was called the Spear of Light, had joyous reunions with family members they thought were dead, but unfortunately Tem was not one of them. In the months following, he would be plagued by dreams, nightmares surrounding the events at a high charity. In some, he would venture back into the city and try and save his family from the parasite, as spores engulf the inner dome. He would have to fight through hordes of screaming, terrified, fleeing people to reach his family, and using his augmentations, would try and alter the outcome every time he dreamt. He'd try and save them, but often his wife would just ask why he didn't come for them. Other times, he would witness her slow, violent infection and transformation into a host of the parasite, watching as she screamed to take their child and run while tentacles ripped through her flesh and tore her apart. Sometimes, a squad of elite blade masters would come and try and kill them, slashing Yala with their swords until all that remained was sizzling flesh and bloody cloth before eventually coming for him, causing him to flee into the spore cloud, cradling his child, and running from one certain doom to another. But every time, every dream, he failed, and the two fell victim to the parasite. These awful nightmares continued to plague him, almost nightly, so much so that they made him learn the entire inner layout of the Shadow of Intent and dream himself sprinting through its corridors so that when the day came and he were to board it, he'd know exactly where to find and murder Artas Vadum. Sometime later in 2553, following the total fall of the Covenant, he and the Minister departed the flotilla. He promised Tem that they would get their revenge on Artas and the Shadow of Intent for what they did to his wife and to the Holy City, and to do so, 
they have to travel to a highly secret installation in a region of space typically out of bounds for profits, the coordinates of which the Minister had acquired from Truth during the war. Within this installation, they discovered a tool with cataclysmic potential. A miniature prototype halo ring, the real reason the Minister wanted to capture the Shadow of Intent. As I'm sure you can probably imagine considering he was a prophet after all, the Minister cared little for Tem's family. Rather, he intended to use the Shadow of Intent to transport this halo to Sanghelios, where he would use its reactors to power and fire it, wiping out all life not only on the planet, but in the entire system. However, to ensure that it would actually work, they first needed some test subjects, and so Tem was sent to Ranello, an elite colony where his objectives were twofold. Firstly, capture elites to test the Halo one, and secondly, draw the attention of the Swords of Sanghelios and bait Artas and the Shadow of Intent in. And both plans were successful. The elite prisoners were taken and disintegrated by the firing of the miniature Halo, and the Shadow of Intent was onto Tem's trail, now harboring Artas and one Tul Joran, the sister and daughter of the elites obliterated by the Halo and captain of the Kaiden's Guard on Ranello. Tull went with Artas to save her father and brothers who had been captured by the Prelate, and to then seek revenge on their kidnappers and, sadly, unbeknownst to her, their murderers as well. Sadly, it had been Tull's father and brothers who were used as test subjects for the Halo. Knowing they were onto their trail and would follow them to the installation, Tem and the Spear of Light waited for the intent to emerge from slipspace above the planet of Juran, besides which was a dwarf star. As Artas appeared, the Spear began attacking the planet, causing the intent to retaliate, but as it did so, the solar interference from the star disabled the intent's energy shielding and plasma cannons, allowing Tem and a battalion of brutes to board the ship and attempt to seize control of it. As the conflict on the ship ensued, Tem and a small group of brutes managed to push through, heading for the bridge where Artas and the Shadow of Intent second in command, Blademaster Vol Saran, were located, while the rest of the boarding party continued to fight Tull, Stolt the Grunt, and a number of other grunts and elites in the hangar. When the prelate finally encountered his target, he thought his mission was a success but Stolt, Joran, and a group of elites started attacking from behind. After engaging Joran in an extremely high intensity duel, during which he revealed the purpose of his revenge mission and almost even killed Joran using her own energy lance, the blade of which was thankfully blocked by Artas, he tried to make his escape. Realizing it was far from a success before being knocked unconscious by Stolt. When he awoke, Artas begun his interrogation seeking to learn the prelate's intentions, although Tem remained a closed book, speaking only to blame Artas for his family's death. The Half-Jaw's reaction to hearing this, however, surprised Tem. It was one of remorse and sadness, and when he told the Half-Jaw how he knew his family was dead, it caused a revelation. When he told him the minister had informed him of their death, Artas simply shook his head and said convincingly that there were still people alive in High Charity when he left. This created a moment of sickening possibility within Tem. If what he said was true, that meant that he could have saved his loved ones from the parasite. There was a chance that their blood was on his hands. But Artas didn't let up. He continued this verbal torture of Tem singing the ballad of Kel Darsam to him, an ancient elite song of which the name Spear of Light originated from, and that Tem would once sing as a lullaby to his child. Drowning in despair and regret, before finally leaving the cell, Artas informed Tem that they had discovered where he and the minister were working, and plotted the Shadow of Intent on a course to the miniature Halo. When they arrived, they took two phantoms down to the installation, with Tem on board as a hostage guarded by Stolt. However, as they neared this foreboding place, it let out a massive pulse, stunning the ships and giving Tem enough time to wound Stolt and use Artas's blade to cut his ties, allowing him to escape the phantom and travel towards the installation. The team relentlessly pursued their captive, 
As he reached the hangar, he was greeted by the minister and his drones. It turned out the prototype Halo was no longer stable. It had been fired so many times now that it was beginning to literally crack and fall apart. But the minister revealed his plan to use it on the intent one last time against Sanghelios to Tem, which should, all things considered, still work. Tem was not aware of this. He hadn't thought beyond getting revenge on Artas in the Shadow of Intent. He hadn't thought what the minister's ulterior motive or overall plan was, and he didn't quite like it. Furthermore, Artas had successfully sown the seeds of doubt in the prelate's mind. He replayed what the minister had told him over and over and over again in his head, but the genuine remorse that Artas had shown when he told him about his family turned what was once a black and white situation into one that was entirely grey. And it was in this grey where his rage continued to build. But it was when the minister told him that all that time ago, as they were leaving High Charity, he had simply told Tem what he needed to hear, that he knew Halfjaw told the truth. The minister had lied about his family, and in doing so, had prevented any possibility of Tem fighting his way back through the city and through the parasite to save them. There was a chance he could have saved his wife and child from the most horrific death possible, and yet, the minister put his own life above them. As the prophet began verbally assaulting him, saying that what he had lost in losing the sacred promissory and all the ancient artifacts within it far outweighed him losing his wife and child, his augmentations had triggered automatically. He was ready to defend himself. The Minister of Preparation ended his monologue by revealing that he had many more prophets lined up to fill Tem's place. He had lost his entire family protecting this prophet, and yet still, he was replaceable to him. And the drones began firing. There were too many for even Tem to handle, and in the process of trying to put them all down, he was mortally wounded. However, before they could finish the job, Artas and Joran showed up, mortally wounding the Minister, who then limped off to the Halo Bunker and activated its final pulse. As the two quickly hunted for a way to stop the ring from firing, the charging sequence of the only 10 meter diameter Halo began affecting the reality around them, making it hard for them to speak or think and distorting their mental state. Tem, knowing that time was running out, picked up a satchel of grenades and attached them to his gravity belt. He looked directly at Halfjaw and, in a rather poetic way, told him all along he was right. The elites had not formed some ridiculous pact with the grave mind, and the minister had lied and almost certainly led to the death of his family. The two, once mortal enemies that were now bound by a shared hatred of the prophets, shared a moment of peace before ordering Artas and Tull to flee the station. Once they were safely out of range, Tem dropped the grenades down a power shaft, destroying the installation, the halo, and the one who took everything from him. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the entire backstory of the Prelates and the punished Temba Tech. One of millions, actually, no, one of billions, who fell victims to the Prophet's vile lies. A truly sad tale, if you ask me, like many related to the Prophets in the Covenant, backed up by some seriously cool lore, and with an awesome sprinkling of Artas Badum characterization something that we absolutely do not get enough of. It is an absolute crime that Microsoft have not given a blank check to Joe Staten to come back and write Halo games. I mean, the man is a narrative fucking genius and he just gets Halo more than anybody else, more than any other writer, if you ask me. Please, please go and read Shadow of Intent or listen to it, of course, on Audible. It is easily one of my top five if not top three favourite Halo books of all time, that focuses on one of my favourite Halo characters of all time, and it reads like a proper classic Bungie-era story. Joe, you still got it, my friend. You still got it. But yeah, that's all for today, guys. Thank you very much for watching. I want to give a huge thank you to everyone over on Patreon for the continued support, as per usual, and thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it, and I'll catch you all in the next one.